Good morning, everyone. Good morning to those who will watch us online. Glad to have you out. Today, uh, we continue our series talking a little bit about fighting for a good faith. And uh, we are going to tackle a tough topic today. So you're going to need to put your thinking cap on a little bit. So I'm giving you fair warning. And if you need to stay awake uh, to engage with the material, I always want you to remember that next door, uh, there is the Keurig, there's coffee, hot chocolate, tea over there, that type of thing. So uh, grab a cup before you come on into service. Today, we want to welcome you again. And as we say each week, that this is a safe place for you to explore your faith. One of the things that often happens in church is many times it is the church that gets threatened by the questions that people have about their faith. And rather than be honest about them, many times they uh, try, try to force those questions to the back. What we want to do here is continually engage in the questions that we all have about our faith, the mysteries that we all encounter along the way. And this is a safe place. And if we can uh, ask questions honestly and humbly and try to engage those, then one of the things that can happen is we can walk away, even if we don't land on the same spot, we can walk away with a growing awareness that life is a gift and love is the point. And we have the opportunity to really show that we are disciples of Jesus by the love that we have for one another. So welcome. Let me give you a couple of announcements today before we get started. Uh, Mark and Brenda uh, worked this past week to uh, get the giving statements for you for your contributions from this past year done. And Mark mailed those. You should be getting them in the mail if you're getting ready to do your taxes and that type of thing. If you'd like to give uh, going forward, you can do it by mail. Mark Bowes, 476 East 330th Street in Willowick or in person at that kiosk back there, or online at shadetreecc.org. Now, we're finishing up a series. Uh, we have a Zoom study on Wednesday nights from 7 to 8 o'clock. And we're finishing up uh, talking about confronting Christian nationalism. That's where we began in this series. And all of those so far have been uploaded to YouTube if you want to uh, take a look at those. Beginning the first week of February, we're going to take the month of February, and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the topic I'm going to introduce to you today, and that is fighting homophobia. And what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at all of the major clob, uh, clobber passages, as they're called, by people that are critical of acceptance and uh, affirmation of the LGBTQ plus community. So you might find that interesting. One of the things that we will be doing is trying to do what we need to do in all our Bible reading. We need to ask the question, what is the context, what is the circumstances, and what is it trying to communicate? So if you want to join us or catch it later on YouTube, you can. So today, I would like us to begin, before we have a word of prayer and before we have Emma and Corey come up and lead us in singing, I would like for us to have this idea in mind throughout the whole morning. So the Bible is full of stories. 80% of the Bible is narrative, telling stories in the Old Testament of the nation of Israel, in the New Testament of Jesus and his disciples. And there's a great potential in stories. Now last week I talked to you about images. And I showed you a few images of the insurrection a couple of years ago. I showed you a picture of a guy carrying a Confederate flag through the Capitol building. I showed you a picture of George Floyd with a, a knee on his neck. And those type of images do two things. They invoke or evoke certain emotions in us. And then from that, we see what the backstory is to that. And once we enter into the backstory of something, there are two things that can happen. <clears throat> it can instigate a desire for further knowledge, and even the stories themselves can help educate. These two things, images and stories, then becomes the basis for some of the policies that we pursue in our country that is seeking out justice and equality among all people that call our country their home. So I want you to keep that in the back of your mind. We're going to talk about stories today. 
And the stories that we're going to talk about in particular talk about uh, the LGBT community and some of the things that they have experienced and some of the things that they have grappled with over the course of the years. So I also want to share with you a story out of the book of Matthew to get started. So Jesus had a forerunner, his cousin, he's called John, He was called John the Baptizer. Uh, he was an individual that called upon a whole generation of people to repent from their outlook on life, and he would baptize them. And John the Baptizer one time confronted the religious leaders of his day, the Pharisees. And it says in Matthew chapter 3, beginning in verse 7, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. So the key of this series has been, how do we fight for a good faith or something that produces good fruit? And then he goes on and he says, and do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. And then this verse, verse 10, the ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So he uses this image of a tree being cut down and then he goes on and he talks about how this should inform them to become better in the way they are conducting their religion. So today, I want you to keep in mind here that at times God has to take the tree down in order to produce a tree that will produce good fruit. So I ask you to stand with me. And I want you to keep this in mind as we approach this topic today. That loving our neighbors sometimes means dismantling the systems that oppress them. That's true. Last week we talked about racism, and today we're going to talk about homophobia. So today we want to understand that we are not an island. I'm going to have Emma and Corey come on up, and they're going to lead us in the song Island. Oh, 
home to me, I will be home to you. No one is an island. You will be home to me, I will be home to you. No one is an island. You will be home to me, I will be home to you. No one is an island. You will be home to me, I will be home to you. No one is an island. So there is all kinds of information that is available to us depending upon who we follow. One of the individuals that I follow on Facebook is Reverend Stan Mitchell. Sam Mitchell founded a church called Grace Point Church down in Nashville, Tennessee, and he uh, transitioned that church from being a non-affirming to an affirming, affirming congregation. He felt God prompting him uh, to resign from the pastorate and become a devoted ally for the LGBTQ plus community. And so he interacts with people that uh, ask him questions or uh, present to him problems that they face because they are getting pushed back when they came out. And I want to read to you a story from a young man that uh, asked him this question. This comes from January the 16th. And on Facebook, he asked Pastor Stan this question. Dear Pastor Stan, I have blue eyes, always have. I'm right-handed, didn't try to be. I have red hair. So does my mom and grandpa. I love to read. Mom says I wouldn't go to sleep when she read me a bedtime story because I love them so much. I have two dogs and a cat. My parents loved animals and I love them more. I loved church as a child. Mom says I always asked the big questions and was filled with wonder. I loved school and learning, hooded with a doctorate at 25. They say I always wanted to research and teach. I'm doing that in a postdoc fellowship at an Ivy League school. I've always been competitive. My folks have a room at their house filled with my medals, certificates, and trophies. It's like a me shrine. And all of the above makes sense to my parents and extended family. They have always been more than happy to own some portion of all of that. But when I say I have always been gay, the room clears, the phone goes dead, the conversation ends. They tell me it is unnatural and there is something wrong with me. Their prized and proper child becomes their confused, problematic son. And this part of me that is their problem, this aspect of my life that leaves them confused, happens to be the part of me that simply longs to love and be loved in a committed relationship that, if I play my cards right, might look like the relationship my parents and grandparents have always enjoyed. And I'm left heart, heartbroken. And they are left trying to make me the me that makes them okay. I have blue eyes. I'm right-handed. I love to read. I'm smart. And I'm gay. Please be happy with me is my message for them. Now here's his question. Should I just give up? If you say yes, I should, well, I can't. I still need them. Maybe I shouldn't, but I do. For a little while longer, anyway. Hear the power of that story, right? Those stories are in spades across this country. Time and time and time again, People reaching out because they want to be loved and they want to love. And yet they have felt that their attraction is to someone of the same gender. 
So it caused me to ask this question. What do you do when a sexual minority, compared to the majority population in the country, comes out and says, will you love me? Will you support me? And I found this passage in Isaiah chapter 56. Listen to what it says. This is what the Lord says, maintain justice and do what is right. For my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the one who does this, the person who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it and keeps her hands from doing any evil. Now listen close. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose what pleases me, he started with justice, and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name, that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to Him, to love the name of the Lord and to be His servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and I will give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations." The sovereign Lord declares, he who gathers the exiles of Israel, I will gather still others to them besides those already gathered. Now what's fascinating is the use of the word eunuch several times in that passage. A eunuch is a sexual minority, one that does not fit the standard protocol, you might say, of a normal society. And God says, I'm going to give them a better name than sons and daughters. How can you beat that? He looks down upon them with great love and acceptance. And he calls them to follow and be a part of his family. So today, I want to do an intercessory prayer. Remember, it says, my temple will be a house of prayer for all nations. So on this day that we're going to talk a little bit about homophobia before we sing another song, I want to use this as an intercessory prayer. God of the seekers and dreamers, the disaffected and the disillusioned, the worn out and burnout, the rejected and leavers, we ask for blessings as we travel, as we doubt, and as we meander. We ask for the grace to leave when necessary, to come home when we can, to create new homes when we need to. We ask for protection of our souls from those who don't understand, who judge, and who mock. We pray for the fortitude to undertake the journey even when it's scary, or maybe especially when it's scary. We know that as we wander, we are not alone. And as J.R. Tolkien says, not all who wander are lost. We know that sometimes we have to leave the confines of what we knew to see the truth to hear your voice, and to find out what to do next. We pray you lead us where we need to go by whatever route it takes. We pray for new ways to see you, to understand new ways of being in the world. And we pray for healing and for redemption and, where possible, reconciliation. We pray for all of this so we can know wholeness, know our bodies, know each other, know you, and then be found. Amen. Would you stand? Let's sing together. Lord, I need you. Oh 
is born, when grace is found, is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me, yes, where you are. So we continue this series, Fighting for a Good Faith, and I want to remind you of a couple of things before we actually get into the topic here this morning. First of all, what we're doing is we're outlining some of the major things that are often battlegrounds in our culture. We talked a little bit about fighting nationalism. Last week we talked about fighting racism. Today we're going to talk about homophobia. Next week we're going to talk about violence in our culture and how to approach that. And then we're going to talk about fighting sexism and ageism as we finish off this topic. And then we will go into a series for the time of Lent that leads up to Easter. And uh, we're going to be in the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, during the weeks that lead up to Lent. So if you want to do some reading on your own, uh, Luke, um, the third gospel in the New Testament, is a good place maybe for you, for you to do some reading, just to kind of get the feel for the way uh, Luke presents the ministry of Jesus. So today, I want to remind you that we're using this as a key verse, fight the good fight of the faith. And we said that you can either fight uh, for a good faith or you can fight for a bad faith. And that's why we're trying to define some of these areas. We also said that it's not just on an individual level, that there are systems in place that often reinforce a bad faith. And that's why Paul will say, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, and powers of this dark world. Then lastly, he prays that all of these walls that occur in the first century between Jews and Gentiles might be taken down and that Jesus might be the peace of these two groups that did not get along very well. In our culture, there are a variety of things that separate us from others who make this country their home. But yet the prayer of Paul is the same for us as well, that we might see the walls of hostility come down and that we might seek out a one humanity of peace and love and joy. So that brings us to today's topic, fighting homophobia. This particular topic is, again, built upon a lot of misunderstanding at times of different Bible texts. Sometimes it's built upon an inward prejudice that we have learned from the beginning 
of our childhood, the way we have seen other people act with a community of people. And we have also said that the stories that we hear cause us sometimes to uh, begin to uh, be more educated about this topic. And that's what I'd like to do this morning is talk about how stories force us to make choices. Now, when you think about stories as a whole, the thing that stories have in common are the heroes, the villains, and the victims. Whoops. How about that? I guess I shouldn't have eaten toast and... Right? That made my finger slippery. Okay. Is this going to... You can pause that any time, Corey. <coughs> there we go. There we go. See if I can do this without doing that again. <clears throat> so, when you read stories, here's what you need to look for. It doesn't matter if it's a story that you're watching on TV doesn't matter if you're reading it in a novel or if you're reading it in the Bible. Every story is built upon heroes, villains, and victims. Just watch for that the next time. If there's a missing component, that story will will bore you. Okay? You'll turn the channel if it doesn't have these three components. Well, the stories that we find within religion break down the same way that there are those who think of themselves as heroes of the faith. They're the ones that are fighting for a good faith. There are those that are the villains, those that we are afraid of, those that should be shunned. And what happens sometimes is those villains become victims because of injustices done against them. Or if there's a pushback that's hard enough by those that have been victimized, then those that are the heroes become victims. So in a culture that we find ourselves, one of the things that sometimes happens is people that make a stand against certain individuals in our society, when that person or a group of people pushes back on the narrative that they are communicating, all of a sudden they flip to being victimized. Well, I'm being persecuted for my faith. It's a fail-proof system. When you're a hero, you can look down upon other people. When they push back on you, you become the victim because you're the one that's being persecuted for your religious faith. So here's the way I put it. Within religion, the heroes are those who think they are keeping the purity of the faith, and when there is pushback, they become victims, and they call for the elimination of the villains, if not literally, at least figuratively, because they are the religiously impure. This has been the story over the last several decades. The people that we love dearly, that are part of the LGBTQ plus community, have had to put up with a religious system that has pushed back on them for many, many years. And as they have engaged with that, they finally had their Popeye moment. You know what a Popeye moment is? The Popeye moment is enough's enough. That's all I can stand and I can't stand no more. So Popeye takes his can of spinach and he begins to fight back against that which is being done usually by uh, Brutus in the cartoon. Uh, And the victim is usually his girlfriend, Olive Oil. Now, that's all I can stand and I can't stand no more. So this can be true of racism. It can be true of this topic uh, on the, the LGBTQ plus rights within our society. And so when there is pushback, all of a sudden something happens. That's where these heroes of the faith all of a sudden become victims. Now, I read for you a passage out of Matthew chapter 3 earlier. John the Baptist confronts the Pharisees and the Sadducees for their religion doing harmful things. 
And you'll find in the Gospels, you'll see this in the Gospel of Luke when we get to this series, that they will push back against Jesus. They will push back against what the disciples are doing because they all of a sudden have become victims. And now all of a sudden the villains are Jesus and his disciples. Ultimately, Jesus will be killed and crucified upon the cross primarily because of the push of the religious community. Does that make sense? Okay. So the religious community wants all the power and control, but when a group pushes back, all of a sudden they become victimized and they say, we got to get rid of this villain. So when you keep that in mind, one of the things that happens in our society is when there are groups of people who come out, like that young man that I read off the Facebook page, they have all of this going for them, they're smart, they're educated, they have talent, they have gifts that they can give to the whole world, and yet because they come out as gay, because they have an attraction to the same gender, all of a sudden one of the things that happens is there's pushback upon them because now we, we are afraid of who these people are. And I'll get to that in a moment. There's kind of a panic that comes out of the hearts of people that don't understand the individuals who have known, usually from a very small age, that they are gay. And so what happens is culture begins to push back and they begin to try to put policies in place to take away rights and recognition from the LGBTQ plus community. Homophobia, and for that matter, transphobia as well, is the fear of, aversion to, and discrimination against sexual minorities, sexual and gender minorities, not minorities in the sense of being uh, not worthy of other people in the society. I'm just talking about percentage in the population. That's all I'm talking about. Discrimination usually restricts participation in society with the same freedoms as heterosexual people. So as you know, back in 2016, I lost my previous job, and that was the year of the Marriage Equality Act. When Essie and I came out in favor of that, that all people uh, should have equal rights within our society uh, to be able to get married to the people that they love, then there was that pushback, and um, we became the villains. And as the villains, we then got pushed out of that position. Now, what happens is this discrimination can find its way in a variety of different levels in society, but most often it is found within the church. Look at this last point. This discrimination often bans this community from church membership, being able to serve within the church, being able to lead or take sacraments like baptism, communion, and marriage. That's all off limits. And yet, many churches will say that they're open and affirming, but if they do not provide the uh, civil rights and the religious rights of other people, well, they're not, okay? They're just kind of using a smokescreen. So what happens here is all of a sudden now, the church gathers together and builds up a momentum so that now what we find is there are individuals that are trying to push uh, for some of the rights that have finally been granted to the LGBTQ community, the, uh, those rights they would like to repeal and take back again. So keep your eye open for that in the coming year. What happens, though, is this. There is a scapegoat me mechanism built into all of this. Now, it's not just LGBTQ+. We, as individuals, often have a scapegoat mentality. And here's a variety of different people that are often confronted uh, with this problem. It can be whites, it can be Chinese, it can be straight, it can be American, women, Christians, rich, poor, Russian, blacks. The list could go on forever. And right up at the top is gays there. Now, what happens is a thing called the mimetic theory that was proposed by Rene Girard a number of years ago. And here's what he said. He said, as he observed uh, in his research, 
that the way people feel safe is when they gather together and they have a common enemy that they can direct their hatred and distrust to. And so if you look in our culture, one of the things that happens is take any one of these. Those people are bad. Those people can't be trusted. Those people are not safe. When in reality, these individuals are all gathering together and creating their own little subculture and anyone that's not in that subculture or doesn't agree with that subculture is a person that can't be trusted and to an extreme is a person that needs to be eliminated. So as you know, there has been an ongoing problem within the last several years of uh, shootings in gay nightclubs. This happened as recently in Colorado Springs of November of 22, where five individuals were killed, a number of other people were injured. Back in 2016, the Pulse nightclub down in Orlando, there were a number of people that lost their lives, and there were a number of people that were injured in that. And it all goes back to this phobia that these people are not trustworthy, these people are not safe. So I asked myself the question this past week, where did all of this begin? When did this cultural shift begin to take place in our country? And I want to tell you the story of a man by the name of Matthew Shepard. Before I get there, here's Rene Girard's quote. He says, a scapegoat remains effective as long as we believe in its guilt. In other words, as long as we believe that this person is worthy of persecution, the uh, scapegoat mechanism remains in effect. So I want to tell you the story of Matthew Shepard. He lived uh, 1976 to 1998. And I want to get the facts straight on this. So I'm going to come back to my notes here so that I don't miscommunicate it. On October the 6th of 1998, this University of Wyoming uh, freshman, Matthew Shepard, was approached by Aaron McKinney and Russell Henderson at the Fireside Lounge in Laramie, Wyoming. These three young men had talked, had a few drinks, and at the end of the night, McKinney and Henderson offered Matthew a ride home. But the ride took an ugly turn. They took him out to this remote place, and this is the actual site in Wyoming, where he was tied to that post there after he had been beaten. They tied him to this fence, uh, and they took his wallet and they found out where he lived and they went to his home to burglarize it so he was set up. 18 hours later there was a cyclist that was riding on this road and they found Matthew Shepard still tied to this post here. He had been beaten so severely that he had severe brain stem damage and by the time he was taken to the hospital He was in a coma, and he lost his life, never regaining consciousness. He passed away on October the 12th, 1998, so six days later. He was 21 years old. He was an individual that was a bright young man studying political science, and he was chosen as the student representative for the Wyoming Environmental Council. He had many friends, he had a close extended family, and his father described him as optimistic. He was an individual that did not hide that he was a gay young man. Even though he was a gay young man, he was accepted by his peers for the most part. In his college community, he was known uh, for his openness, and his father said that he had a great passion for equality, and he would accept the uh, differences of other people. So why was this young man tied and beaten and left for dead? The two young men that were eventually arrested were charged with a hate crime. This hate crime was built upon something where they pleaded uh, guilty, but by reason of insanity. 
And what they pleaded was the gay panic defense. Have you ever heard of that? The gay panic defense. So in a court of law, they claimed that they had temporary insanity because Matthew was a gay young man. They were afraid that he was going to take advantage of them. And that he was going to try to seduce them in some way. And he was an individual that supposedly created this phobia within them that they were going to be harmed. So they took him out, they beat him up, they left him for dead, and they went to blur- burglarize his household. This started a cultural shift. At this point, the gay community began to push back after it came out about why Matthew Shepard had been killed. And so at this point, the culture began to try to keep the gay community in the closet, but the gay community had their Popeye moment. And they began to form and organize and things like Pride and other communities like that began to gain traction because they said enough is enough. Can't stand this anymore. Now, when they pushed back, remember what I said about those three individuals. The heroes became victims, right? And all of a sudden, oh, they're trying to impose their standards upon me and my religious rights are being violated. No, they're trying to survive. Do you realize back in 2014, the FBI said there were 1,400 such crimes against the gay community? People that had been beaten. And yes, some of them that had been murdered. The problem was, many in the LGBTQ community did not want to push back because there were not laws in place that defended the LGBT community, so they kept quiet. The FBI says there were probably a lot more cases than 1,400, and they had reasons for staying in the closet uh, and not saying this uh, um, abuse was done to me because they felt the system would not be on their side. Well, sometimes what happens is there is a collective trauma, and the LGBTQ community has had to deal with collective trauma for many, many years. And this collective trauma is, are we safe in our own community? Are we safe in our own country? Now, what is often thrown out against the LGBTQ community is, well, we don't accept their lifestyle. And that's a bunch of crap. Because what is their lifestyle? What does the LGBTQ plus community want? They want the same thing you do. A good job, health care, friends, right? They want the exact same thing you do. And they also want the opportunity to fall in love and spend their life with someone that they can love in a monogamous, committed relationship. And yet, many times that gets perverted when those who are heroes in defending our Judeo-Christian rights all of a sudden become victims and they begin to push back in against the LGBTQ community as the scapegoats for everything that is wrong in our country. This is entirely unfair. And the reason it is unfair is the failure to listen to science, the failure to do research, the failure to understand how the Bible communicates on this topic. So on Wednesday nights, beginning the first Wednesday night of February, I'm going to take each one of the six passages in the entire Bible that seems to make mention to same-sex activity. What is going on there? And why was it taken to be pushed against a specific group of people? So you might find that interesting. We'll do some exegesis, which is a big term that means hey, what was the context, what were the circumstances, and what was the author trying to get across when he talked about this? So having said that, what we want to do is research as well. One of the things that you can track down and do your own research on is same-sex attraction 
is not just a human trait. Did you know it's found in the animal world too? 1,500 species often will mate with someone of the same uh, gender and, uh, and do so. Uh, here's some examples. Mallard ducks, penguins, apes, elephants, giraffes, sheep, hyenas, lizards, and even fruit flies. Scientists have recognized that sometimes the pairing of these individuals is not male and female, but is often uh, same sex as well. This prejudice that has gone against the LGBTQ community uh, has not always existed to the level that it is in our current culture. What we find, though, is that 3,000-year-old tribal laws that is found in places like Leviticus are often used to clobber a community of people. And these passages are often called clobber passages. Uh, they are often used by clobber critics, if I can put it that way. So what we want to understand today is this. There's this tendency for people that don't have gay friends to have some illegitimate fears inside of them. These illegitimate fears often get um, somehow blown up and uh, exaggerated in so many ways that other people who have some of those same fears inside of them find their comfort with a mutual scapegoat. With that in mind, we need to always be asking ourselves: do we have inside of us a gay panic defense? And the way we can determine whether we have this pay, a gay panic defense inside of us is to ask these questions. Do I have negative stereotypes of gay people? Do I participate in bullying and making fun of people who are perceived to be gay? Do I use hurtful language like fag when talking about gay people? Do I tell offensive go jokes about gay and lesbian people? Do I laugh at them? Do I not treat LGBTQ plus people with the same politeness that I extend to other people? When you do that self-reflection and you ask yourself those questions, you'll kind of know where you are on the radar of this gay panic defense. I believe Shade Tree Community Church doesn't have people that struggle with this a whole lot because some of you in this room are gay and many of us in this room have uh, a gay relative or a gay friend. And with that in mind, what we find is that fear subsides. But a culture as a whole still chooses to live by this fear that's inside of them. And this phobia eventually becomes a problem of offering uh, the civic rights and civil rights of individuals like you and I that take them for granted. So what I want us to think about today is that Isaiah passage that I read for you a moment ago. In Isaiah chapter 56, I read for you verses 1 through 8, and it is there that we find that the prophet is talking about a group of people that we might consider a minority, those that are not a part of the nation of Israel. And then he says this, let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. So there he's talking about foreigners that are not a part of the nation of Israel. And then he says, and let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. What a eunuch is, is a term for a sexual minority. Now, if there's a specific uh, thing that is often done in the Old Testament. Many men were made eunuchs because in, in a group of, uh, of women uh, that were part of the harem to the king, it was castrated males that would be safe with these women. Are you following what I'm saying? So there is a man-made um, eunuch. But Jesus will say to us in the New Testament that there are those that are born eunuchs. And he gives this uh, to us as a description that there are individuals that don't fit the binary choice of male and female. They fit somewhere in between. 
Other cultures have already known this. Native Americans has always recognized more than male and female that there is sometimes a blending and what we find is there are other nations around the world that have recognized that a binary category between male and female is too restrictive to talk about all the people within that country. And what we find is that in the Bible, eunuch is describing someone, whether man-made eunuch or born that way, is been pushed to the side. Now, some of them overcome the barriers. There's a man who is a eunuch from the nation of Ethiopia in the book of Acts, chapter 9. And Philip, one of the disciples, is told to go out and meet this Ethiopian eunuch. And he finds this Ethiopian eunuch. He's in his chariot. He rose above the restrictions of his day. And he's reading a scroll. And this scroll happens to be the prophet Isaiah. And he asked Philip what he needs to do. And Philip communicates with some hesitation. And what we find taking place is that Philip then says, well, you know, God is accepting of you. And this Ethiopian eunuch wants to get baptized. And, and so they find a little uh, bit of water and it is there that he baptizes this Ethiopian eunuch. You go on to Acts chapter 10 and Peter is given a vision. He goes up on the roof to pray one day and he has this vision of a sheet coming down with all kinds of animals in it. And some of them are clean animals, some of them are unclean animals in a Jewish law. And Peter, being a dedicated, faithful, Torah-observing Jew, says, I will not eat of the unclean animals. And God gives him this message in this vision, you do not call unclean, which I call clean. Fascinating. All of a sudden, he moved beyond his own tribal laws to see the bigger message. What the message was communicating, it wasn't really about animals at all. It was about people. You do not call people unclean that I cherish, that I love. And so Peter finally gets the message. He struggled with that, though. He had Gentile phobia. And what we find is that one time he was eating with some Gentiles, and there was another group of Jews came along. This is found in the book of Galatians. And they begin to accuse Peter of eating with Gentiles. And he then gets up from the table and he leaves. And Paul calls him on the carpet for it in the book of Galatians for being so offensive to this group of Gentiles because of the pressure of other Jews. You see, this is found everywhere in the Bible. It's not just a selective group of uh, verses. So what I want us to think about today is I want us to think about what God is doing in the midst of our own community here at Shade Tree. And I want us to think about how to engage with the Bible. And when we do so, we want to take the Bible seriously. Many, many Christians take the Bible literally, but they don't understand context, culture, and circumstances. It's better if you take the Bible seriously. And when you engage in that way, you begin to understand that it's not really communicating what you think it's communicating. So we're going to deal with each one of those passages in the weeks ahead. What I want to do today, though, is give to you another video clip. This one is from the same three guys as last week, but on the topic of homophobia. In the church in general, there are two positions. One is a non-affirming position, the other is an affirming position. So let it be known, online and in person, we are an affirming church, okay? No, make no bones about it. That's where we are. But there are non-affirming individuals within churches that will often use the Bible as a weapon. And the Bible is never meant to be a weapon. It was meant to be this story, group of stories of, that give to us insight and wisdom. And the Bible, because it is not a book, it's a library, has different things to say along the way. So let's say you're going to go into the library and you uh, come up to the librarian and say, 
hey, I want to know everything the library says uh, about, let's say, global warming. Just for example, what is the library's stance? Are you for or against global warming? And the librarian would look you in the eye and would say, there's a mixture of both on these shelves. This is a library. It's not one viewpoint. The Bible is a collection of books, and you'll see things changing along the way. But we pick and choose and cherry pick many times in the Bible. And when we pull this out to make it say what we want it to say, all of a sudden we're not taking the Bible seriously at all. We might be trying to take it literally, but we're not taking it seriously. And when that happens, it produces a lot of harm. And this is a confession of the Christian church who finally is waking up to that. Let's watch. Hi my, name is Hi, my name is Brian McLaren. I'm a former pastor. I'm an activist, a blogger, an author. My name is Greg Boyd. I'm a teaching pastor at Wilden Hills Church in Maplewood, Minnesota. Hello, I'm Brian Zond, pastor of Word of Life Church in St. Joseph, Missouri. I'm also an outspoken ally for LGBTQ people. I'm a straight Christian, and on behalf of the straight Christian church, I want to ask forgiveness from the GLBTQ community. And I want to apologize to the gay community for the treatment that you have often received at the hands of people who profess to be followers of Jesus. Hi, I'm Bruxy, and I want to apologize to members of the LGBTQ community. Throughout history, and yet to this day, straight Christians have judged you, we've excluded you, we've persecuted you, we've scapegoated you, all because you're different from us. The worst way, the most demonic way that we achieve unity is we pool together our own anxiety and fear and rage and project it upon some nefarious them. It's called scapegoating and it is demonic. And too often it has been gay people that have received that kind of hatred. The queer community has, over the years, been so horribly stereotyped by conservative Christians. The Christian church has been, until very recently, a universally hostile environment for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer people. Even to this day, a lot of straight Christians put the blame for social problems on the GLBTQ community. The reasons for this are complicated and sad, but it involves with the same kind of misuse and misinterpretation and misapplication of the Bible that led to the discrimination against women, led to anti-Semitism, but it expressed itself for all of history up until now in homophobia. I want you to know that insofar as straight Christians have acted and continue to act that way, they are acting in complete contradiction to what Jesus stood for. You know, Jesus never sided with the Pharisees and scapegoating certain people groups and judging them. In fact, he rebuked the Pharisees for their self-righteousness. In fact, Jesus sided with the judged. He, he hung out with those who were the most judged in his day. The Apostle Peter says that two words should come to mind when we're talking with someone with whom we disagree, and that's gentleness and respect. Gentleness, how we approach someone, not with condemnation, but with compassion and with a sense of care. Respect turns it up a notch and says, I not only want to be involved in compassionate care and kindness in our dialogue, I want to be in a learning posture. I want to be prepared to honor and respect where you're coming from. I had a dear friend who uh, in our senior year came out to me. My religion said that he had made a choice of a lifestyle and all this kind of ridiculous garbage that I was taught. And I look back now and I think my religion made me a worse person toward my gay friend than I would have been otherwise. Jesus taught us that we're supposed to love like the rain falls and the sun shines. The rain never picks and chooses who it's going to get wet and the sun never picks and chooses who it's going to shine. It just does what it does. So also, Jesus commands us to love without any consideration for a person's sexual orientation or their gender or their social position or their nationality or color of their skin or what have you. I would love to call other fellow conservative Christians to a new embrace of the gentleness and respect that the Bible calls us to. That we should learn how to love, honor, and cherish 
those brothers and sisters in the faith with whom we disagree. And to those who are gay, bisexual, lesbian, transgendered, or queer in any sense of the word, to those of you, whether you are Christian or not, I want to say I am sorry because the people I am a part of have failed to show you Jesus. We have shouted the gospel as though it was a message of anger and condemnation rather than lived the gospel as something that should transform us first so that we can love the way Jesus loves us. I want to apologize and I want to pledge to seek to listen and to understand and to help gay Christians find a way to fully participate in the life of the church. It's time for us to apologize, to admit how wrong and evil and cruel our behavior has been, to make no excuses except to, just to say we were wrong and we're sorry and we are committed now to leading the way to do better. The judging that straight Christians have done towards the GLBT community was done in God's name. But I want you to know that God is not behind that. God's heart grieves whenever straight Christians have treated you this way. Because God loves you. God loves you with a perfect, everlasting love, just as you are. You're made in the image of God, and Jesus gave his life for you, and you have unsurpassable worth. So you couldn't matter more to God than you do this moment. And insofar as straight Christians, we're supposed to be ambassadors of Christ, representing Jesus, insofar as they have not reflected that worth to you, but have instead looked down on you, and judged you, have been self-righteous towards you, excluded you. And so far as they've done that, I ask for your forgiveness. Would you stand with me, please? If you become a friend, an ally, someone that works on behalf of justice for the LGBTQ plus community, there will be pushback. I guarantee it. But it's worth it. It's worth it. And I tell you what, there's a whole world of people that have been pushed aside that have so much to bring to us, not just here, but to our culture as well, if we will have the open heart to do it. So let's end with this thought. There is another ending to the story, the one where we set about the business of building a bigger table and filling every chair, the one where we burn down the bins and throw away the lists, the one where we lift up the fallen with an outstretched hand, the one where we never look away. I like this story better, don't you? I like that story better, don't you? So we go in peace, and we try to be a peacemaker. Join me in prayer as we close. Thank you, Father, for our time together. And certainly, we've only touched the tip of this topic. But we thank you that we can begin to orient ourselves to our own panic and our own defense mechanisms. Help us to have an open heart and an open mind. Help us, Lord God, to learn, to grow, to stretch, to, uh, to serve. All these things that are necessary in our world. As Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, so figuratively we wash the feet of those. Of those individuals that are often pushed aside and pushed into the mud and the dirt and left to die on the fence post. Lord, we ask that we will be individuals that have a huge heart. And may it be reflected in the way that we show love to all people. For I pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great week and we'll see you next week, okay? Take care.